in this highly industrial decade just how pure is our air? To what degree are we contaminating it by oil and gas fumes? Pollution and overpollution, unless checked, could so warm the earth in 200 years as to create a greenhouse effect. This land that is ours together is a great and a good land. It is in that spirit that I address myself to those great issues facing our nation which are above partisanship. Will your policies become more, say, pro-environment now? They've always been pro-environment. Anyone who allows political bickering to weaken our progress against pollution does a tragic disservice to every American. We have worked as one people for 25 years, as one people. One of the uh, key strategies was to sow doubt about climate change science. There has been consideration both of the scientific certainties and uncertainties. We do not know how much effect natural fluctuations in climate may have had on warming. No one in the science scientific community disputes that this would be catastrophic. The science is screaming at us. If we set our minds to it, we could in this country produce 100% of our electricity. I said before the world that we needed a strong global agreement. The United States will withdraw from the Paris Climate Accord. We're getting out. Anchor. I'm going to um, go over this top roll on a belay, and then um, we'll go from there. One, two, three. Woo! Right. How much more rope? Yeah, that's probably your last turn. Okay. Off. Oh. All right, Jeremy. Be careful. One, two. Traditionally, when we think about climate activists, we might think about conservationists. We might think about people who have dedicated their lives to protecting the environment. Or we might think about people who live along the coasts. But the truth is that climate change is impacting everyone. The environment wasn't always a divisive issue. And at the end of the day, what we're fighting for is clean air and clean water and a sustainable future for kids. So why is that so polarizing? How do we get there? You know, when I started Protect Our Winners, I had no idea that um, the front lines would be um, you know, here in Washington, D.C., but it just became clear that real action uh, needs to happen at the policy level, at the federal level, at the international level. Winter as we know it will be half in 2050, and by 2090, 80%, which means winter as we know it will be three weeks long. That is heartbreaking. The winter sports community represents $72 billion, 695,000 jobs, which I point out is 70,000 more jobs in the extraction industry. As bad as that is, and, and the thought of not having winter as we know it absolutely breaks my heart, we realize the global effects on um, the importance of snow for our water. California, 60% of its water comes from snowmelt. The Sierra is this perfect aquifer. The alarms are everywhere. This is the challenge of our time. We represent a huge audience and they want action on this, but we are running out of time. I definitely never thought of myself as an environmentalist. I was not looking to be a so-called environmentalist. But my whole life is committed to the mountains. 
I ended up having a lot of success going to the world's most beautiful mountains and figuring out how to ride those. The best lines are the ones that you are like right on the edge of life and death. Big mountain riding is about exploration and figuring out what's around the next corner. You know, that's where a lot of the buzz comes from. It was through that time and spending time amongst the glaciers that I started really seeing this change. I'm seeing the glaciers recede. I am seeing more consistent rain. I mean, it's nothing's more heartbreak than rain to the top of the mountains in January. At that time, I had a massive carbon footprint. I realized even though my career was just cranking, I couldn't justify that my love was having this just blatant obvious impact on the planet. The other key factor is I was finding the edge of the boundaries. If I can figure out how to walk for days on end and live out in these mountains and hike up these mountains, I have 90% more of the world's mountains to choose from. My first foot-powered trip in Alaska, I got this whole new group of people and I've sold these other people on the idea that, hey, we're going to go out there and we're going to camp and we're going to hike these things. See you later. The problem was I didn't know if I could do it. Holy Oh my god! Oh! Are we gonna get work right here? I don't think so. Oh. When we shifted to foot powered snowboarding, it brought in so much more complexities, and in many ways, it was more dangerous because. Instead of being on a slope for one to two minutes, we're on a slope for one to two hours. You are forced to let everything strip away and give the mountains your attention. Yeah, just let me check it real quick. One, two, three. These windows of opportunity when this unridden, big, serious mountain is safe to ride, that window opens and closes with these really little subtleties. Dropping. Line of my life, man. <laughs> I'm alive today because of my intimate connection with the mountains. So naturally, I saw changes to the mountains and it coincided with what scientists were telling me. As I've learned about the science and how critical snow is to humanity, I'm like, if we don't have snow, the least of our problems is gonna be that a chairlift isn't spinning. The ripple effects on that and the disruption of that, I can't even imagine what that uh, means on society on a whole. Family is hugely important to me. Now my highs in the mountains, they're generally tied to being out there with my kids. I really started thinking like, what is the planet my kids are coming up in? Any parent wants to provide their kid with this safe, opportunistic, sky's the limit kind of life. The more that you look at the science, it's really clear that we are doing a major disservice to the kids being born today. I knew that collectively we needed to come together to do something for it. And that's what led me to start Protect Our Winners. I'd like to see if you guys have any calluses on your hands. Um, I bet most of you came from a lot of money 
and you love to ski, which is something that, you know, people that come from money can do a lot of. The working Americans like myself, which you have nothing to do with and don't understand and you don't respect, they uh, vote and uh, your bull climate agenda is totally wrong. People like you uh, can ski and play in the snow while all of us work our asses off. So that's why your organization's not going to be around in about 20 years. I hate conflict. I, I pride myself in always finding common ground with people over anything. My idea of a good time is not debating trolls out there. I mean, there's 413 comments on here. I don't even know where to start. You know, well, here's the classic. Yeah, you fly to Alaska and to Alaska range probably all over the world and I bet you drive something that utilizes said fossil fuels on a regular basis and those boards you ride have product made from fossil fuels as well. Hashtag hypocrisy, hashtag bandwagon, hashtag don't bite the hand that feeds you. Dude, don't stay stupid crap. This planet is warming with or without humans. It happens every 10,000 years. We all want to keep riding, bro. Coal is cleaner than wind generated. That's, there's just no science. Why doesn't Jeremy Jones set an example and stop using fossil fuels himself? No more helicopter flights, synthetic clothing, or epoxy or fiberglass. My response to that is I live a very examined life, chipping away at my personal footprint. It is important for us to embrace ways to uh, reduce our personal footprint, but we also need large scale uh, systemic change to get the reduction that we need. It's just not getting there with just personal choice. The Earth may or may not be heating up, but there's no debate that the fight over man-made climate change certainly is. We're now at 17 years and eight months of no global warming. Carbon dioxide has not caused weather to become more extreme. We just had two of the coldest years, the biggest drop in global temperatures. Bottom line, big tornadoes, F3 and larger since the 1950s have dropped dramatically. Bottom line, we've gone the longest period without a major US category three or larger hurricane hitting the US. Bottom line. This isn't about science. It's not about facts. This is really about government controlling almost every aspect of your life. 97% of all scientists believe- Is this a bogus number? It's so not a bogus it's number. It's so a bogus Okay, number. yours is, mine no. is yours. A lot of these scientists are driven by the money that they receive. If there was no climate change, we'd have a lot of scientists looking for work. What about Nin the scientists who say it's worse than ever? Uh, I don't think your party's passionately committed to science or to fighting global warming or to dealing with the scientific facts we live with. I think the science is very mixed. It became clear to me that I live in a bubble with like-minded people and that there was a large population of this country that have different views when it comes to climate. I wanted to know where the spin was coming from, so I decided to reach out to some of the most prominent climate deniers in the country. People that have spent their whole professional career trying to discredit this mountain of scientific evidence, but they're not actually scientists. Hello. Hey, Mark. How you doing, George? Hold on one sec. I can't hear you. Let me get sound. You see me. You don't see me yet? I don't see you, though. I'd love to see All you. All right. Awesome. Hold on. Hold on. Oh, wait. I got you. Cool. All right. To kick things off, again, it's pretty clear that you don't believe in the impacts of climate change. And I guess just getting some background yeah. um, behind why. Well, good question. Uh, yeah, I, I won't go too far into my background, but essentially I come at this as an investigative reporter, not a scientist. I like to joke that I sometimes play one on TV, a scientist, but <laughs> I look at climate as a essentially a political movement using the latest environmental scare to lobby for politics. When you testified before the House Select Committee on Climate, you know that is one of the most anti-freedom, most regulatory things. They're excited about the prospect of government regulation. So that's where this debate goes off the rails. I mean, I couldn't agree more. The facts should not be political. Hate the fact that it's a partisan issue. I guess as you've dug into the science, I mean, what is- Science, 
gets in line behind the preferred policies. And we see this with the National Academy of Science. Oh, this is the body founded by Abraham Lincoln, this AGUS science body. No, it's literally 100% dependent on government funding. Do you have kids? I have four kids. They are being taught that you know, they're, my old 14-year-old Jeep is not a weather machine. It's not, your know, SUV does not control the weather, that we are not in unprecedented times of any kind. And I tell them not to worry about climate one ounce. It's terrifying for me um, what I'm seeing happening with snow. It's tough as a business. I worry about my kids. It keeps me up at night. The idea that we face a climate catastrophe is not happening. The idea of a climate emergency is a political construct. When I hear you say about the volatility, the extremes, and the, that's called weather. That's called climate. It does that. You can't predict anything. It's just that when people tell you that, you know, the climate's changing, we're causing it. This is a record here, a record here. It's meaningless. I think the important thing is to understand what it is that divides uh, climate activists and climate skeptics. Really what it boils down to is, are we creating a climate crisis? Are we creating a climate where we have much greater negative impacts than positive impacts? You guys recognize that the earth is warming. You're not sure what the most effective way to address that or how much humans are playing a role in that? I think your question, it presupposes that a warming climate is bad or a warming climate is something that we must fight. Where I live, we get our water from snow in the mountains. Not having snow um, would affect, you know, our, our water source. Well, you make a few points there that um, we see statistics and facts that contradict this. So, for example, uh, well, first of all, about the snow, if you go to uh, Rutgers Snow Lab, what they say is that for the past 30 years, the data that they have is that there's been increasing snow cover extent. Well, I, I guess just to back up that, you know, I am not a climate scientist, but I am someone whose life literally revolves and watches every drop of snow fall in my range. The stuff I do in the mountains is really based around having a really good understanding of, of snow. And so it's easy if you think that if you've heard in the media or from other people, from activists, that global warming is causing a uh, decline in snow uh, to therefore look around and, and try to get a little confirmation bias on that. But the evidence is what the evidence is. On average, the amount of snow cover that you're going to see today is greater than it was 10 years ago, is greater than it was 20 years ago, is greater than it was 30 years ago. And I'm just amused that you would laugh at that when you're just going on subjective thoughts and I'm going on scientific evidence. Misinformation and propaganda works because it's based in reality, but it's not real. Reading a scientific paper and pulling one fact that supports your narrative is how the game works. Because really, how many people read the science? It's only when you dive deeper that you find the real facts and facts don't lie. Satellite data has shown a slight increase in snow cover in the fall, but the average snow cover throughout the year has decreased year after year after year. I've seen it firsthand and I've heard it from real climate scientists. We can choose not to listen or we can choose to do something, but we can't ignore the facts. It's science. The facts are the facts. So I have been talking uh, recently to these professional climate skeptics, deniers, what have you, and um, the consistency of the messaging uh, has been impressive. The fact that many of these people have the same talking points is not a coincidence. Almost all of them are funded through right-wing and libertarian think tanks, and those think tanks are themselves funded by the fossil fuel industry. So there's a very conscious and very deliberate effort to pump out disinformation. It's always been about discrediting the science, trying to make us think that the scientists don't know what they're talking about or that scientists are just in it for the money or the attention. Besides trying to discredit the science, climate change deniers have really played on identity politics. They've tried to make conservatives think 
that they should not accept the evidence of climate change because if they do, it will lead to higher taxes or bigger government. Have you had any success in changing uh, someone's mind on climate? There are some people who are really, really recalcitrant, but in the middle, there's a very wide range of views. People who maybe kind of get the issue, but they don't really understand why it's important, or they've heard these things about maybe it's a liberal hoax, and so they're, they're not that happy. And I feel like most of my work is in that space. It's trying to explain to people this is not a liberal hoax. It's not a hoax of any kind. Nobody invented climate change as an excuse to expand big government or raise taxes. But we have this problem, and now we have to figure out what the solution is. And then the other thing is just to remind people of conservative and Republican solutions. We have models of successful conservative interventions. And so then the question becomes, so why has the fossil fuel industry been denying these models? Why does the fossil fuel industry tell you that climate change is a hoax rather than telling you, oh, well, we could fix this with emissions trading just as we did for uh, acid rain? And then that brings to the third important point, which is that this is a big lie. That's actually a con game. That the reason we're confused and divided is because the fossil fuel industry has been trying deliberately to confuse and divide us. ExxonMobil is laughing all the way to the bank, making trillions of dollars in profits off this con game, and we're stuck paying the bill. We have to vote. We have to vote in people who will represent our interests and not the fossil fuel industry. After a decade of going to Washington, D.C. with Protect Our Winners, I've learned that these elected officials don't actually lead they follow the people. And there are a handful of purple states that are equally divided Republican or Democrat that can go either way. These are states that swing elections and these are the places that will choose our course on climate action. But a recent New York Times poll showed that climate is the most divisive issue in our country, even more than guns. So much weight is put on these elections with the hope that people just take 10 minutes out of their day or an hour out of their day every two to four years and just check a box for what they believe in. I live in the blue state of California, just 30 minutes from Nevada, and Nevada is one of those crucial states. It's actually the most mountainous state in the lower 48, so I started exploring Nevada just to get a feel for it. All right, Ming, we might just have to start exploring. Oh, I just really missed carrying a heavy pack. As a country, we used to agree that the environment was worth protecting. Conservation used to be a bedrock issue for conservatives not that long ago. Richard Nixon championed a lot of our environmental laws. He signed the Clean Air and Clean Water Act and created the EPA. Why has it become so polarizing that people have made it their job to troll people like myself that are fighting for clean air and clean water. It's just amazing how divided we have become. Yeah. Just totally blown away at the raw wilderness in Nevada. Everywhere I look, protected land covered in snow that provides water for farmers, family, and a healthy ecosystem. It's what I live for. Seeing new mountains, picking out what really calls your name and figuring out how to climb them.
one thing that probably gets under my skin more than anything is when I'm being attacked as being un-American. Because I'm very proud about the country I live in. Patriotism isn't just about waving the flag around. It's about coming together as a nation and working hard to solve these key issues. America is based on people standing up for what they believe in. It's based on people having different opinions and coming together and finding common ground. What we stop doing as Americans and society is talking to each other. Big badass mountains. Love my Nevada board. The whole point of the climate change advocate uh, alarmism is shame to get you to stop behaving in ways they say are destroying the planet. That's how they've succeeded in it. They run around I always wondered if we are as divided as they say we are. I think everyone wants a clean, healthy environment for their family. We just gotta figure out how to get there. I decided to go to one of the most conservative counties in rural Nevada and talk to these people that love the mountains as much as I do. Right here, we're about a half a mile from the base of the Ruby Mountains. From our backyard, we can hike basically from here to 9,800 feet and ski back to the house in the wintertime. It's a winter wonderland here. I've been involved with National Ski Patrol for 23 years. You know, I grew up in the Sierra foothills and the mountains are my home. That's where I find my peace. It's been a great place for my kids. Skiing is the one hobby that really challenges us. But all of us take an interest in reviving old Volkswagens or old dune buggies and bringing them back to life. Those are things that bring our family together and keep our family connected. Oh, that's a simple thing. Ah, looks like we need a new hose clamp. Oh! Uh. Many of my friends have been born and raised here. I think coming from a place that's very different than this has given me a lot of insight. Like the cool thing around Elko County is trucks, horses, and cows. I mean, I agree those are all cool, but there's a lot of other cool stuff too skiing, rocks. I don't think anyone else in my class of like 200 is going into geology. Right now with the climate change, I think it comes down to our groups. Just like high school, we have our little social groups and we want to fit in. If you agree with another group's perspective, your group might say, hey, we don't like that, and kick you out. I think a lot of people don't speak up. They just go with the group mentality of, they believe this, so I will also. Volkswagen people are their own group. It has no lines. They share a love of driving their old tin cans. Skiing is very similar. They come from all different backgrounds, all different beliefs, but when it comes down to it, like skiers just want to ski. I'm psyched to be at your home mountain. Yeah, this is the Big Elko Snow Bowl. Controlled here for a long time. It's a, definitely a great place for local families to learn how to ski. We have our one chairlift. And how much is the lift ticket? $20 for a lift ticket here, $20 for a rental. And if you're just doing the rope tow and you're just getting going, it's, it's cheaper, cheaper yet. What's up, Justin? 
Nice to meet you. God, pleasure to meet you. <laughs> You're a geologist? Or, or, yeah, yeah. That was that was what I went to school for. Mostly, what I'm doing now is project management and mining. Yep. Um, both here and doing quite a bit over in Kazakhstan as well. Wow, there's some mountains there, huh? Yeah. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. It's awesome to get out here with you. You know, someone makes their living as a hunting guide. And as I learn more and more about conservation, uh, I've learned that hunters are really the original conservationists, you know, through the Roosevelt era. And quite frankly, I think the outdoor community has a lot we can learn from the hunting community when it comes to protecting these public lands. You, what were you doing at, when you were boring holes underground? Yeah, so in New York, they were fixing the old aqueduct to supply 500 million gallons a day to New York City. We came in, dropped like a $15 million machine down there, put it together, and then drove away from the existing aqueduct, went underneath the Hudson, tied back in. So we'd go down the, the bottom of the shaft, get on a locomotive, go into the tunnel boring machine, and then uh, you'd just be sitting there mining and, and building rings all shift. I'm assuming you must have tons of engineers, like the science and engineering yeah. to do something like that is yeah. cutting edge. It's almost like going into space. I had a great time, but like I said, I, it was either I do that and like focus on a career and money and like a powerful position, or I come out and just focus more on life and living. I'm stoked you hit me up. Yeah, I was surprised. I was like, man, there's, there's thousands and thousands of riders, like pro riders would probably be, so you want to go ride with Jeremy. I don't know why he's, he's calling me, but. <laughs> Dude, you, this is your range, man. You spend yep. more time here than anyone. You're the only local split border I know in, <laughs> in this area. Oh, I have no doubt the climate is changing. I mean, that's a no brainer. Right. I guess my question to you is, why is it that like here we're standing on ground that was considerably warmer, maybe a tropical climate at one point. I mean, a lot of the stuff was ocean, it's which ocean. is amazing. So the earth has had several cycles and it's always changing. You're totally right. Glaciers move and shrink. And I mean, they shaped these mountains. That's right. um, it's just that the speed is what the alarm is coming from. Okay. You know, records show that it's happening a hundred times faster than it ever has. Like your world operates on peer reviewed science from the best universities in the world. Right. And that science is from the same universities that the climate science is coming from. Right. There's massive consensus from the scientific community that burning CO2 is warming the planet. I mean, imagine you going down 900 feet down and being like, 98.8% .8 of the scientists are telling you to do it this way. The rest are saying, you do it that way, you know, you're gonna die. Yeah, yeah. I would assume you guys are going with the 98%. I'm definitely not um, like kind of fighting, saying, oh no, it's, it's not happening. You don't fight the science. No, no, but it's just tough around here because you know, the climate talk gets lumped into a bunch of other policies that are mostly on the liberal agenda. A lot of times that comes with a, a lot of other stuff that affects their business and their livelihood. And their ideology. For sure, yeah. I'm a single issue voter, as you can tell. Yep, yeah. <laughs> I'll get yeah. past everything. If you're a, like yep. serious about climate, you can get elected, I'm all in. So one of the things that we tried to do is to unify uh, what we call the outdoor state, which is all these outdoor enthusiasts, hunters and anglers, people that really relate to the outdoors that rely on a healthy environment to come together to fight for the environment. And specifically, we recognize that long-term climate change is the biggest threat. Yeah, because I, I mean, it, it is a common, common thread. I mean, right. I mean, yeah. I think it should be a no-brainer that it's a nonpartisan issue. I mean, it's just a, it should just be a human issue. Unfortunately, I, I think we're going to need something borderline catastrophic, if not catastrophic, to wake people up and to make serious, positive change, unfortunately. Right. That's, that's what I feel in my heart. Yeah. 
I mean, my daughter's only nine years old, and I'm genuinely scared for her future. Yeah. Genuinely. I mean, it's it's no joke. It's hard, because the last thing you want to do is, like, tell your daughter that. You know, it's like, everything's fine. You know, like, you don't want to freak them out. <laughs> um, but it's like... I'm laughing because I've already told her that. There are numerous coal-fired power plants here in northern Nevada held to really strict regulatory standards, emission standards. You look at the emissions coming out of those coal fire plants in those, you know, second and third world countries, and it's a black cloud coming out of it. And it's, yeah. it's nothing that you see coming out of the ones yeah. here. I mean, like I say, the regulation in the U.S. is far and above the regulation across the rest of the world. We had this whole Paris Climate Accord, and we pulled out of it, and it, it was pretty much for that reason was, you know, we. The U.S. didn't want to pay for these other countries to say that, oh yeah, we care about the environment, but we're not going to do anything about it. What bothers me, I think, with some of the climate change legislation and stuff that's gone on is it really affects just our country and we're still doing business internationally. Here we cripple our industry, but we still contribute to pollution by still buying those products from someone else that's just going to pollute the environment. My big issue with it is, you know, the U.S. extracts more fossil fuel than any country in the world. Right. We heavily subsidize it. A ton of it's on public land, and we know that the burning of fossil fuels is a major contributor to warming of the climate. We do know ways to create clean energy. I just would like to see the country embrace that more. At the very least, I'd just love to see an even playing field. It's gonna have to be phased out eventually. Right. You know, just because, I mean, we're, we're gonna run out of those resources. I mean, the main word there is, is transition, and, you know, it's not a light switch. You can't just shut it off. And, 100%. I mean, There's not a single plan out there that says, like, shut off all coal and oil tomorrow it's um it's this De depending on who you listen to yeah i mean there there are some and, and there's there's radicals on either side right in reality everybody's probably looking at something down the middle that right. everyone can agree on but you know politics has become a game recently and sporting event yeah exactly <laughs> yeah fighting. yeah i think the big thing is is the solutions for it you know yeah that's where people get hung up i think and it's easier to blame like there's no problem. Well, I think um, debating solutions is a great debate. Right. We have half the country that is poking holes in the science when we need 100% of the people figuring out solutions. Yeah, no, it's for sure. You know, I like to think about it like climbing a mountain. Like, I'm not saying we have the summit ridge. We have our Hillary step to equate it to Everest figured out, but we know which way the summit is. Yep. And we're still in base camp arguing about how to finish the summit ridge. Yep. And it's like, maybe we should just start walking to camp one. <laughs> we definitely know how to get to camp one. We actually know how to get about three quarters of the way. No, Let's start a... just going one step at a time. Yeah. You know, I think there's a lot we have in common. Yeah, I agree. I mean, you're hunting in the mountains, as I am. I'm just hunting for different stuff. Yeah, you're hunting for the ultimate turn, I guess, and I'm hunting for the elusive mule deer. I don't know if I could take the shot, because full disclaimer, I don't eat meat. Well, full disclosure, I'm a carnivore, so I'll take the meat. <laughs> <laughs> We get some epic sunsets in this state, that's for sure. We're lucky to be here. We are lucky to be here. I appreciate the conversation, it's good. I have more questions than I have definitive answers. I'm not opposed to someone proving me wrong. I don't have that big of an ego where I, I feel that I'll never accept information. I just want to see it presented to me in a fashion that seems credible. I think if you step back, you know, we're all on the same team. We're on Team Planet Earth. Classic coolie. 
Yeah, man, we're doing it. Love this stuff. Yeah, it's great, man. You got a nice backyard, Danny. That's right. What dreams are made of. Dropping, baby. Hell yeah. Think that uh, you know, hard rock miner from Northeast Nevada, the pro snowboarder, California, whatever, really meet up, yeah. and talk about you know everything, and go snowboarding in the mountains. That's that's not something that's normal, but it's the type of communication and interaction that I think we need to get out there more, get different opinions. Coming from a, a bigger city or from a different state, you got different things that push your buttons, different things that's important to you. And just because I haven't thought about it and it's not important to me doesn't mean that it's it's not a big issue. Yeah, Jerry. <laughs> Woo! I met some great people in Nevada, even made some new friends, had some great conversations. And it turns out we are a lot closer on many of these issues. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but the heartbreaking reality is that unless some conservative leaders change their mind on climate, there's no candidates that these conservatives who care about the environment can vote for. It made me wonder if a conservative leader could get past identity politics and take climate serious. Are you afraid of the climate crisis? If I only listened to politicians like Al Gore, I'd be afraid too, very afraid. So I came out of the precincts of the right as a young man. I found myself uh, working at the Cato Institute in 1991. I was hired to oversee their energy and environmental uh, policies. For the better part of the next 23 years, I spent my time at Cato arguing against the case for climate action. You're not that worried. Not particularly. Uh, there have been about 13 studies. Four of the estimates are that the economy would actually improve if we have it. But I found my ability to make a convincing case just completely fell apart over time. It's a monumental move that very few people have made. What changed your mind? It was not any one thing. It was a, a series of uh, three or four things. The first thing was my uh, lack of faith in the overarching scientific narratives we were telling. It also became clear to me that I had not been doing my due diligence in really putting a critical eye to the arguments I wanted to believe to be true. That seemed intuitively pretty strong. And I found over and over and over again, I was seeing variations of exactly this kind of thing. Sometimes it was cherry picked data sets. Sometimes it was misrepresenting the position that was actually being taken by the mainstream scientific community. I'd love to just ask you a couple quick fire questions on what, what they're telling me, what I'm consistently hearing. So climate change is natural. We've seen fluctuations through, throughout history. 
That's like saying death is natural. We've seen people die all through history. That doesn't mean that Bob shot Jim. The f kind of argument is that? I'm sorry, I'm being, it's Friday. Yeah, I love it. I, that's great. Okay, next one. There isn't a consensus amongst climate scientists on human-caused climate change. Screaming total out of this world goddamn lie. Every single survey of credentialed, peer-reviewed, published climate expert shows a near absolute consensus. Earth is old. We only have 100 years of data. Yeah, both true. But we know how to estimate temperatures from the past based on, you know, carbon rings and all kinds of sediment analysis and ice core. We're not like making this crap up or playing on a Ouija board. Addressing climate change will ruin the economy. Yeah, these things will not be cheap. It's going to cost, depending upon your estimates and your policy preferences, anywhere between six and 20 trillion dollars to globally decarbonize. But what are the costs of not globally decarbonizing? Well, there'd be a shit ton more. I can tell you, it, my biggest takeaway is is just how blown away I am on their just utter and total certainty that there is no problem here. It was actually like really hard to have a conversation with them because they're so cemented in their point of views. Risk management is not about picking the most likely scenario based on what we know and saying policy needs to be determined on that scenario. You have to weight the probabilities of each of these scenarios coming to play, coming to pass, and looking at the costs and benefits that follow from each of them. And if you do that, it is absolutely unmistakable that we need to decarbonize as fast as possible. Because if we're wrong about the scenario, we don't get the more likely scenario, we get a low probability, high impact scenario. So it's game over, there's no other planet, there's no other way to, you know, we're just, we're completely effed. Yeah. Yep. Hold on. Okay. I got it's you. Right here. You're good. All right. We're off. So just, we want to move through the convex rolls um, with speed and kind of be a little light on them. And then, Cass, with your line, we just, I, I want to dial you in with the cornice entry. Um, there will be slough, so if you do have to stop or you fall or something in the fall line, expect some slough coming down on you. Three, two, one, drop it! First crux of the day. Me a Jones. Drop. Oh, it makes a nice heel turn into a toe turn. Nice air. Deb, you should get some mum pal. It's not hard to understand what's at stake here. But sometimes you gotta step back and realize what the fight's all about. We don't have to agree on everything, but we do need to stop arguing and start working together on solutions. We have an opportunity to make real change. Change is scary, but change is constant and with change comes opportunities. Cass. Yeah. Are you going cornice or the rock or are you cross? Cornice. Okay, make sure you have your direction perfect. Ready? Oh, so 
close. Good try. I think it was Martin Luther King who said, you can't beat hate with hate. You can't, you know, beat darkness with darkness. It requires light. You see in the media, online, everything, it's all about like, how can we get everyone as mad at each other as possible? I want to do this. The end goal is to try to connect us around clean air, clean water, and a sustainable future. The path we're on is a path of destruction. It's unsustainable. You know, there's a real sense of urgency and that's gonna take a lot of work and that's what we're pushing for. The only way I'm looking my kids in the eye in, in 20 years is going, I fought like hell to try to get us on the right path. At the end of the day, we need climate champions leading our country. We don't need the whole country on board. We just need 51% in the right places. And if I can do that, one voter at a time, that's how it starts, just like climbing a mountain. One step at a time, one voter at a time. <laughs>